I'm the director of the Science and Conservation Center, Billings, Montana. This whole subject is very emotional. It's, uh, it's strident, the, the discussion around it. Uh, it's been an issue here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and I know that quite a few experts have found their way through Pittsburgh, both from uh, agencies and other academic institutions. And primarily their message has been this doesn't work. Uh, it's interesting that all this pr these witnesses, uh, expert witnesses who have prayed at themselves through Pittsburgh have never themselves been involved in any wildlife contraceptive uh, projects of any scale. Uh, and they have offered to you a variety of opinions and ideas and conjecture and assumptions. But they haven't given you any numbers. They haven't given you any data. What I'm going to talk about tonight is not opinion not conjecture, not assumption. I'm going to talk about numbers, tables, graphs, all of which have been through the peer review of science uh, and published, but not opinions. And so my real message underlying this talk, the real goal and objective is to make it really clear that it works, despite what you may have heard. And uh, we learned four important things from this study. The first thing we learned is that in deer, as opposed to horses, they will extend their breeding season by up to two months if you treat them. And of course, the opponent said this will cause a huge energetic problem. In the winter, two additional estrus cycles, this will be really hard on these deer from an energetic standpoint. So we caught them the following summer and we weighed them. The treated deer who extended their breeding season by two months and didn't get pregnant were on the average 20 kilograms heavier than the untreated deer who didn't extend their breeding season but got pregnant. And by fall, all the differences were gone. So there was no energetic cost. The second criticism was, oh, with that extended breeding season, the bucks now are going to wear themselves out and they conjured up visions of meadows filled with dead deer in the spring with smiles on their face. We learned that all the early breeding up through December was done by the big bucks, and then they quit. Young bucks, spikes and forkhorns, followed, not with a frenzy, because remember, their testosterone levels are going down, and they're not allowed near estrus does when the big bucks are active, but the big bucks quit, and now these young bucks sort of followed the others around. Uh, hardly ever uh, even breeding. The third thing we learned was that when the study was over, we unilaterally overreactomized these does, and there's no effect on the ovary at all. And the fourth thing we learned was really interesting. If we get some of these deer, we just gave them a single shot in the fall, just a single shot. And the following spring, guess what? They all had, uh, they all had fawns. We didn't contracept much at all. But when we gave them that single booster the second year, contraceptive levels went right up to the ones that had received two shots the first year. And everyone had been saying, this whole thing is useless unless you have a one-shot vaccine. And we're spending a lot of time, energy, and money on that right now, uh, but we didn't need to because if you're willing to throw the results out for the first year, then you're there. Every deer is a one-shot deer. So those are the four things that we learned. And one by one, the scientific arguments against this were falling. Our first chance with real wild deer was on Fire Island National Seashore off the coast of Long Island, and they were overrun with deer. And of course, the critics are all saying, well, you might do something with those deer, but you certainly aren't going to decrease the number of deer. That's what happened to fawn production over just the first four years. We started this in about 93 or 94. That's what happened to fawn production. This is the most important graph that you will see. Here's where we were, and here's where we are now. And that equates to a 60% reduction in the size of the deer herd in those communities. A 60% reduction. But you will continue to have a parade of skeptics and critics who come through Pittsburgh and other places and say, you can't reduce a deer herd with contraception. That, folks, is not my opinion. That's data. 
And we don't even do the population studies. Biological Resources Division of USGS, people who spend their whole lives doing deer population uh, studies, generated this data. And we moved on to the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It's a one square mile high security research facility with 6,000 employees. State of Maryland, they had about 300 deer. And the state of Maryland wanted to have a deer hunt in the middle of a high security facility with 6,000 employees. This is the percentage of the herd that we treated and this is what happened to fertility rates. More pictures of fertility rates and here's what's happening to the population. Here's where we started, here's where we are now. That equates to a 40% decrease in the size of that herd. And we haven't been at this one as long as we have Fire Island. But you'll still hear you can't reduce a deer herd with contraception. But somehow we have data that says you can. This is interesting because the critics also said, well, if you chase all these deer around with dart guns, they're gonna run all over the place and they're gonna, you're gonna see a big increase in deer car collisions. This is the population curve for NIST as a result of contraception. This is the deer car collision curve. Now we're doing a project on Phipps Island, uh, South Carolina, um, and we're testing a one-shot long-acting form of the vaccine, and uh, this is the control pregnancy rate. This is one type of uh, of long-acting vaccine that we're using, and you see we've, we're down to 25% pregnancy rates. And another type um, of the vaccine that we're using, we're down to 0%. So this is moving along very promising. Now, very quickly, regulatory issues. Until now, Food and Drug Administration was the sole regulatory agency. And the opponents who don't want this used will say two things to you. You can't use this because it's experimental and it's not approved. The word approval, as used by the Food and Drug Administration, means over-the-counter or by prescription commercially. And we never had any intentions to make this a commercial vaccine. And in fact, we have taken steps to make sure it can't be patented and that it doesn't become commercial. So FDA didn't know what to do with us. Now, how many of you know someone who's taking a cancer drug? Probably a lot of you. All of those no, not all. Most of those, 90%, are not approved by the FDA. Their use is authorized by the FDA, as is our vaccine, done through something called an investigational new animal drug exemption. And that will only be issued by the FDA if you can provide pilot data that ensures them this is pretty safe. And then you're allowed to use this under their authorization. No, it's not approved. And because it's not approved, it carries the name experimental. And that's used to scare people. Within the year, all regulatory authority for wildlife contraception, with the exception of zoo animals, will be turned over to the EPA. And this is just the list that I know of firsthand of academic institutions that are currently involved in the development of wildlife contraceptives. This is a partial list of government agencies, state, federal, other countries, our country, either supporting, using, or doing active research in wildlife contraception. And this is a very incomplete list. It's all I could think of at the time, but there's actually another five at least. Proprietary companies working on wildlife contraceptives. And the two thoughts that I'll leave you with, and you already know the first one, it works. It works well. And the final thought that really bothers the critics is a saying from someone by the name of Lerner from way, way back, and that is, men die, but ideas don't. Thank you. <laughs>